Welcome everyone to session number 18 of our decolonial reading group on decolonization, neocolonialism and human rights. This is our last meeting this summer and we're very honored to have Professor Jerome Branch with a promising title regarding the Afro-Hispanic as area studies on its content and discontents. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that even though we have been meeting in a digital space this whole time, we are doing it in the name of Columbia University, which was built on Lenape land in Manhattan. I am deeply grateful that we can meet in this space and take the time to think about how to decolonize our thoughts and our institutions so that this acknowledgement eventually becomes less symbolical and turns into a more just and tangible decolonial reality. Now I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our speaker, Professor Branch, to you. We already discussed some of his work during our session with Felipe Castro Maldonado back in February, but now we have the chance to speak to the actual author, and this is very exciting. Jerome Branch is Professor of Latin American Literature and Cultural Studies and Chair of the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literatures at the University of Pittsburgh. He's specialized in the Black Atlantic, critical race theory, as well as in issues of culture and coloniality in Latin America and the Caribbean. His teaching and his research focus on racialized modernity and the way creative writers across the Atlantic imagine and write about slavery, freedom, the nation, being, and gender. Branch has served on the executive board of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora and as chair of the Ethnicity, Race, and Indigenous Peoples section of the Latin American Studies Association, the LASA. He currently holds the position of treasurer at the Instituto Internacional de Literatura Iberoamericana, where he's editing a series of Afro-related narratives and critical works, The City Malunga. Branch's books to date include Colonialism and Race in Luso Hispanic Literature um, and the Poetics and Politics of Diaspora, Transatlantic Musings, which is the one that we have prepared for the session today. Among many other collections and journal articles, Branch also edited most recently Post-Colonialism and the Pursuit of Freedom in the Black Atlantic, um, which was published in 2018. That's the other book I shared, as well as Black Writing, Culture, and the State in Latin America, published in 2015. His current book projects study the necropolitics of slavery and race in the imaginary of empire and its aftermath. Professor Branch has won too many awards, fellowships, and honors for me to mention here, but, uh, and also I don't want to steal any more of our valuable time with him. So Jerome, let me just thank you for being here. Um, we have truly been looking forward to your presentation. It is a very big honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katharina, for that very flattering introduction. A uh, very good day to you all. I should like to, uh, start by not only thanking Katharina for the invitation to speak, but to the rest of the group as well uh, for taking time out of their summer break to spend a few moments to discuss this uh, or these topics together. As a departmental chair, I'll offer a word of congratulations additionally to you for putting the program together uh, and for inviting this long list of scholars. Uh, with whom you've been in dialogue over the past few months. Evidently, I feel honored to be named among them. Um, well, you've already explained a, a bit of confusion about the actual text that we're gonna talk about. So I'll just proceed um, with, with my remarks focused on the, uh, the topic that we agreed on eventually, that's to say, area studies in relation to the Afro, the idea of the Afro-Hispanic. It uh, strikes me, first of all, uh, the first question that we have to be, to, to be confronted in considering the matter of the Afro-Hispanic in curricular terms, that is for us as Latin Americanists, is that of identifying or imagining a constituency that might be linked to the term Afro-Hispanic. Just who are we speaking of? Who are the individuals that we are invoking or interpolating to borrow a term from Althusser when we speak of Afro-Hispanics? 
That's to say that whereas African-American or Black studies has been a familiar and recognizable thing for decades now in the American Academy, you know, based on visible and politically active, uh, uh, visible and politically active Black population of some 30 million and coming out of a very particular process of social transformation that we refer to loosely as the civil rights movement of the 1960s, there is no reason to assume an automatic transferal of the notion of a ready-made Afro-Latino or Afro-Hispanic constituency to our field, and less so of a hypothetical and analogous Afro-Hispanic you know, independent field of study. In other words, a hypothetical Afro-African-American Afro, Afro, slash Afro-Hispanic dichotomy can only be a very loose one and has to be conditioned, first of all, by our having in mind that whereas the U.S. is a single large nation state in Latin America, for starters, we're talking about over 20 individual countries with vastly different Afro-descendant demographic quantities. And secondly, individuals who identify as Black or, or are identified as Black in the US would not necessarily identify or be identified in the same way across Latin America. That's to say that while historically Blackness as a social identity was constructed and fixed in relation to whiteness in this country, you know, in terms of a putative polarity and permanence, in Latin America, a similar project of establishing the social, political, and e economic, and God forbid, ontological superiority of whiteness was inhibited, both by the distance of the colonies from the political center of the Iberian Empire and by its geographic expanse, not to mention the importance of the indigenous component to the mix in a developing Latin American raciality. As a result, you had ostensibly different systems of race relations between the US and Latin America uh, defined on the one hand by the polarity and fixity of, the, of one drop blackness and Jim Crow segregation over here. And on the other by race mixture and a fluid uh, taxonomy in Latin America that sought to defend the illusion of racial democracy or, or an absence of racism. The apparent differences, however, should not blind us to the fact that uh, what Charles Mills has referred to as the white social contract is what has over-determined col colonially de de derived race relations in our hemisphere, and that slavery and the attendant ideology of anti-Blackness is what is behind historical Black demographic depletion in many Latin American locations, and that the struggle of, of Black people for true democracy and against political invisibilization and socio socioeconomic marginalization is just as real in Colombia or Peru or Argentina or in Brazil with its celebrated racial democracy as it is in the US, also model. The uh, magnitude, if you will, of the historical event, event of a two-term black male, black male president here and the female vice president needs therefore to be seen in terms of what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow or the George Floyd martyrdom and of the ongoing efforts to suppress black and minority votes, which together tear off the veil of our American exceptionalism and effectively can take us back to the days when the racial status quo was upheld by white mob violence and mass murder of black people. In Latin America, the spectrum runs from socialist Cuba with its protocols of selective inclusivity for blacks to Argentina with its presidents who claim that there are no Afro-Argentines and that blackness is a quote unquote Brazilian problem to Colombia where the promise of land titling with the 1993 Ley 70, Law 70, which offers security and legal ownership of ancestral lands to hinterland, black, hinterland blacks has been uncut, undercut by a relentless wave of assassination of community leaders, both male and female in the past three decades. And of course, we have Brazil's 
inner cities, Salvador de Bahia, Los Favelas, where relentless state-sponsored extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings tend to give credence to Abidias do Nascimento's famous observation that the Brazilian state has some sort of genocidal intentions towards its black citizens. What does all of this mean in terms of curriculum? To get to the point, what does it mean in terms of content? Who, hypothetically speaking, would be upset or apprehensive at the prospect of a vigorous and academically rigorous Afro-Hispanic curriculum or of its equitable inclusion in our larger project of Latin Americanism? If we, recall, if we recall that the quote unquote cornerstones of much Latin Americanist teaching involved stories around bloody conquest, dictatorship, human rights abuses, multilateral forms of socioeconomic exploitation and material and epistemic voice violence, the question might well be raised as to what could it be that makes a consideration of black humanity within that topical mix such a taboo a topic or something that is not worth serious inclusion and study. What might be the implications of having, in other words, not only a larger portion of Afro-related materials in our undergraduate courses and um, graduate reading lists, but also increased numbers of Black and Afro-descendant graduate students sitting in class along with trained and well-prepared Afro-Hispanists on our faculty roster? What if Afro-oriented research was to be accorded the same importance as the Eurocentric uh, approaches and focuses and content that we've been living with from the beginning? What if such organizations as LASA, Latin American, American Studies Association, or the ILI, the Instituto Internacional de Literatura Iberoamericana, or to conscientiously tackle the Afro deficit or the kind of structural prob problem that it is and make a revolutionary push with the human and material uh, resources at hand to level the curricular playing field. What would be the implications for knowledge production or for epistemic balance within the field? What would it mean in terms, uh, in relation to the so-called canon or the lettered city. The larger, the larger uh, Afro-descendant demographic in Latin America, as we probably know, is just north of 26 percent, unevenly distributed, uh, obviously, following the demand for forced labor of captive Africans in the colonial period. That's to say whether in agriculture, in mining, or in rural or urban pursuits. The demographic decrease in these cities and regions that had a majority of Blacks at one time or another, mm -hmm. the result of the inability of the population of free and enslaved Blacks to reproduce themselves due to objective and subjective conditions in the period. The current invisibility of Blacks, at, say, in Mexico City, in Lima, or even Buenos Aires, belies historical moments of majority <clears throat> status and fosters the misapprehension that they did not participate in the building of the nation. Uh, in my own experience, Afro-Mexican Afro Afro presence was explored in the latter 20th century, I used to be a graduate student in Mexico, in terms of what they call la tercera raíz, the third root in what was an incipient project to reconsider the national, racial, and cultural heritage. My point is that Blackness as an academic blind spot, or at best a unidimensional construct, is very much an issue in our curriculum. For decades, when the focus was on the literary historiography, prepackaged into the anthology, the literary anthology, you know, for the survey course, the main actors, of course, were the white mestizo male writers and poets, you know, Rubén Darío, Jorge Luis Borges, Cortázar, Pablo Neruda, and so on and so forth. No need to name them, with a sprinkling of female writers of similar ethnic background. 
So come on, name is, this is my game, and so on. And here I'm thinking of um, earlier editions of such textbooks as Voces de Hispano America, which I've taught, I've taught many years ago in you know, those um, survey courses, or more laterally, Huellas de las Literaturas Hispanoamericanas. Many of these books uh, more, rec more recently have introduced a, a, um, a pre-colonial section, right? And they've been giving more attention to including women writers and even contemporary indigenous writers. You know, for example, you might have a, a one or another bilingual Mayan poet or so. A black writerly presence, my point is, whether in literature, in lyrical poetry or prose, was rare and was limited to Cuba's Juan Francisco Manzano in the 19th century or Nicolas Guillen of the 20th century with Nancy Morejon, another Cuban, tossed in as a token female voice. My own tongue-in-cheek response to such an approach has been to say that if your curriculum overlooks 25, 26% of the population and their writing and cultural production, well, you're shortchanging your undergraduate and your graduate students by giving them an incomplete picture of what there is to know. Of course, the thematic approach to course construction uh, allows for more inclusivity. And that is much in much more evidence nowadays. And increased attention is being paid to such in the, uh, issues as gender, sexuality, and so on. But the, the, the dominance of the traditional text, along with its presuppositions, as I've been trying to, to point out, is still an issue to be contended with. Over time, attention to Afro-Hispanic content has been by way of these specialized courses. Sometimes they call them boutique courses. But it would be an interesting thing to survey the hypothetical content of Afro-related courses or just general, general content in any department or curriculum to sort of establish what the real state of things is. The foregoing is not to say that there has been no movement. On the contrary, and as in so many areas of racialized living and racialized life, Black and Afro-oriented researchers have gone to great lengths over the past several decades to generate a cognitive map of Latin American writers and poets of African descent. After the pioneering work of Arturo Schomburg and Carter G. Woodson in the 1920s and 1930s, researchers such as Wilfred Carty, Richard Jackson, Lemuel Johnson, Miriam Costa Willis, and so on, explored the Black presence in Iberian and Hispano American literature and established it as a viable academic reality and topic in the decade of the 1970s. Thereafter, specific uh, country studies were undertaken that covered Peru, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and so on. And these are associated with the likes of Marvin Lewis, Ian Smart, Michael Handelsman, and the late Lawrence Prescott. The others have already retired. The joint initiative produced two journals of note, which are still uh, in publication. I'm speaking here of the Upper Hispanic Review, which is currently edited by William Luis, Cuba specialist, and Palara, which is the publication of Afro Latin American Research Association. Marvin Lewis, who was the original editor of the Upper Hispanic Re Review, was also the moving force behind the Afro Romance Institute at the University of Missouri for over two decades before its closure to a few years ago. And his initiative is to be credited for producing a new generation of Afro-Hispanists who have continued the work of expanding the cognitive map of Afro-Hispanic writing. The, uh, the current challenge, as I see it, is to consolidate those efforts, both within and without the belletristic tradition. As should be evident, the paucity of Hispanic writers of African descent is a, is, a, is a result of the legacy of invisibilization and disempowerment that began with the denial, with the denial of literacy to enslaved and formerly enslaved people and their descendants. 
and with their subsequent exclusion from those areas of so-called high culture in which literary practice is associated. Instead of, or alongside the canonical chronology that has, that would have us focus on, you know, the Renaissance, the Baroque, Neoclassicism, Romanticism, Modernism, Vanguard, and so on, the current interest in performativity, in vernacular arts, the oral tradition, in popular theater, in visual culture, in gender studies, in subalternity, in the post-colonial critique, in critical race theory, and so on and so forth, in the joint operationality of the imperial church and state in determining the day-to-day -day existence, the day-to-day -day experiences of Black people, and so on. All of that provide us with an, an opportunity and with some theoretical tools to more fully, in my opinion, explore the life work of African descendants over time and locate that broad cor corpus within our concerns as, as educators. Uh, this value exists both in terms of what this life world contained for them, slash for us as a population, and for what it means in terms of a broader national and alternational diaspora collective. That's to say that to ignore the presence of the enslaved for 300 years, as David Haverly said of Brazilian colonial, colonial writing, this 300 years of invisibility, was to ignore and to misrepresent the colonial origin and the consolidation of the country. And of course, similar, simultaneously lose the opportunities, opportunity to find the values that were brought by millions of human beings in a condition of diaspora and relocation and accommodation and discovery and suffering and rebellion and, and recreation. It's also to misapprehend the true roots of the current racial state in Brazil and the rest of Latin America for that matter. You know, and thereby make way for such interesting notions taken seriously by all sorts of academics as the idea oh, of benign slavery. Benign slavery and uh, its corollary racial democracy. It is significant that Felix Tanqui Bosmeniel, a Venezuelan Cuban writer, uh, writing in the uh, 1930s, who, who made the observation that it is in the Blacks and in slavery that his fellow writers, these are a, a, a poetry of writers who have come down to us as you know, anti-slavery writers, that these writers should find their raw material, let me quote here, not, in not only the Blacks, but the Blacks and the Whites, all mixed together to form thereby pictures and scenes that would necessarily be diabolical and hellish, but evident and true, end quote. Not surprisingly, it is also significant that from the context uh, of Bospiniel's group of writers, this was a group of writers that was led by, uh, they used to call them the Circulo del Monte. Domingo del Monte uh, was, their, was their leader. It's significant that Juan Francisco Manzano Emerged. Manzano, as you know, was the only wrote the only Latin American slave autobiography that we know. Right? His relevant his relevance for me is that he was a bridge, sort of a bridge person between the world, the unlettered world, and the world, uh, the the aspirational world of, of high letters in colonial Latin America. And I feel like his role is still to be fully appreciated by literary and cultural critics. Uh, in, a, in, in a similar vein, Colombia's uh, Candelario Beso, who was later in the, in, the, in the 19th century, 1849 to 1884, is also significant for bridging those worlds, right? Particularly for his Cantos Populares de Mi Tierra, 1887, written in the vernacular, in black vernacular, right? Uh, and um, people by ordinary uh, Afro Colombians. I say this because. To, to, to stress the point that literature, high culture, had no place for the vernacular, not even of nor ordinary um, Latin Americans, much less uh, 
Afro Latinos. Uh, undoubtedly, it is out of these initiatives and research and the multicultural impulse that came with the constitutional changes of the 1990s that in the year 2010, the Biblioteca de, la, de Literatura Afro-Colombiana, which is a collection of 18 volumes, was produced and paid homage both to well-known and not so well-known writers and poets. The following year, the Brazilians published a four, four volume collection of Literatura e Afrodescendencia no Brasil, Antologia Critica. There's no need to mention the Cubans because uh, Cubans of African descent have been writing for generations, particularly since the, the revolution. This was an integral part of the revolution. We can come back to that later. It becomes evident, therefore, if we consider these materials, along with other more recent works and works in progress, um, if we consider them in terms of raw material for critics and historiographers, that their continued exclusion is inexcusable. It is important also that an interdisciplinary strategy that brings in, as I suggested, visual studies, the oral tradition, uh, and other expressive arts have the potential to expand the available archive of what is available for teaching and for research. What is more, the recent rise in Atlantic studies and the post-colonial has brought renewed attention to Spain and Portugal and to their former colonies in Africa. What this means is that not only the presence of Africans and their descendants in the Iberian Peninsula uh, from early modernity to the present is available for re-examination, but so too are the effects of, of, of imperial expansionism by the, by the Iberians there in Africa. In other words, Equatorial Guinea, Cabo Verde, Angola, Mozambique, and so on, uh, are all available. You know? and, and along with all of what this implies in terms of cultural production, in terms of coloniality, in terms of the post-colonial, in terms of the north-south dynamic, and so on. Uh, all of this, as I'm suggesting, could be added to a larger cognitive mapping of the Iberian, uh, the Afro-Iberian or the Ibero-African world, world. The degree to which this kind of inclusivity might constitute too much of a challenge for those of us who are wedded to a narrower idea of what constitutes our field is relevant to the point that I'm trying to raise. At the heart of all of this is modernity, coloniality, capitalism and slavery, and the world system as it has evolved over the past 500 plus years. And of course, our place in it as academics in this larger scenario. Some time ago, it occurred to me that given the centrality of the, of the Atlantic in the making of this world, and of the unpaid labor of the enslaved that was so important to its foundation that occurred to me that their collective experience also holds uh, lessons for us. Uh, also holds lessons for us, particularly in the development of a politics of solidarity, a politics of insurgency uh, in their epic stru struggles to adapt to their circumstances and to survive and in terms of the potential of that historical precedent for activism and discursivity. Uh, but as was pointed out at the beginning of our conversation, you guys have already, already discussed the, the, the topic of malungos and malungaje. So there is no need at this point to elaborate on that any further. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you can actually elaborate since um, the group is always a, a different mix of people. And I guess uh, some of the people who are here now have not been there for the for the past session. So if you want to go deeper, or if anyone wants to ask more about the Malungahe concept, I totally recommend doing so. Um, but first of all, thank you so much, Jerome. This was a perfect and wonderful uh, talk. I um, 
I, I would like to publish this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we'll okay. come back to that later. Okay. Anyways, but I guess you probably, yeah, anyways, we'll come back to that later. And, and in any case, I wanted to say um, it's actually perfect because it brought together uh, many of the topics that we've already been um, talking about during the course of this um, reading group. Um, for example, um, with Kayama Glover, who is also uh, mapping travelings of Black writers in the 20th century, obviously for the 19th century, this is a whole different story because it's way more difficult, like you said, um, with like imposed illiteracy to find Black writers next to Juan Manzano or um, another name would probably be Maria Fermina de Reich. Um, so um, yeah, then in the 20th century, um, it becomes more interesting. And I think the other, the other thing that you mentioned is the vernacular or something that you also write about, um, the poetic language of music and how that counts as an archive for historical experience, which is something that Ana Ochoa has also been talking about um, in, in order to somehow uh, find ways to grasp Black and indigenous experience of 19th century Colombia. So I think, um, yeah, this was great for us to have this all present. Uh, thank you so much. I do have questions, but I will give the audience the first chance um, to ask whatever you are most interested in. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, Jerome, hi. Uh, I, I, your take, thank you again for your intervention. Um, your take on, re really remind me, I'm not a specialist in her, but really remind me uh, uh, um, Lelia Gonzalez, uh, uh, a Brazilian uh, author who, who tried to understand blackness in latin america in brazil and she she's mixing three concepts in one formula she's talking about ladin not latin but ladin of the indian ladin mm -hmm. america so she's just mixing uh, africa and america america ladin america and and what what is uh interesting with her is that she i think two years ago she was actually like the 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 authors of, of lassa forum but what is interesting is that um uh she, she 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 was a professor uh a researcher uh, at puki rio at puk rio university where, where i'm teaching too but there is absolutely, there is very, there is not, there is no memorial, there is no uh, a cathedral, there is no a special field of studies for her, you know. Just right now, I would say that under the current uh, government that people try to rediscover her thinking, you know. And uh, and what I meant is, is, is to go into your direction is that it's still very, very hard, even in, the, in, a, in a very liberal and progressive center as, as Pukri University to, to, to push uh, the, 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 the agenda that you, you, you mentioned to decolonize and to bring the Hispanic and the, and, and, and the black, black, uh, black authors. Uh, but it just ring me a bell about Lilia Gonzalez and, and your and your take. So. Yeah, um, thinking of this sometimes makes me remember. I don't know if you recall around about eighteen twelve when the Spanish um, monarchy was under under threat from Napoleon, and in the they, they they decided that it was in their interest to make some concessions to the colonies and the Cortes. And there were representatives from the Americas, the leaders, right? And they were trying to get some sort of um, equity in terms of representation, proportional representation. Cortes said, no, we cannot have anything approaching one person, one vote from the colonies because you outnumber us, right? 
if we accepted all of you Americans, right, um, you would be too many in terms of your potential political power. And the analogy that, that I'm trying to signal here has to do with the fact that many of us in my generation, and it is, it's, still, it's still pretty much the case in, in departments, people are trained with sometimes very narrow specialization. You know, oh, I, uh, I focus on the Southern cone, or I am, uh, I'm an Andean specialist, or you know, I'm a Central American specialist. The word being specialist, that may be all well and good because there was a certain you know, ideal as to division of labor in the academy, right? And you can't do everything when you're trying to get a PhD, when you're trying to establish yourself as a, as a teacher or a researcher. But uh, the question of considering the Afro element for me is a point of departure to question all of that, right? Because on the one hand, um, since there has been an approved and accepted invisible invisibilization of blackness at every level, right? Um, people find themselves now at a time like this when uh, in the context of all sorts of um, social movements in Latin America, Colombia, you would have seen, you would have seen the Cubans are out in the streets, right? The Colombians were out in the streets. The Brazilians are always protesting. All of this means that there has to be uh, it, it has to have implications for what we do and how we conceive, how we see ourselves as producers of knowledge, right? And as I say, you cannot ignore 26% of the population. And they might not be writing sonnets, Petrarchan sonnets, or writing lovely, you know, explore, exploratory, using fancy techniques in, in prose, they have made a contribution to the civilization. And unless you want to stick with that narrow perspective, that male dominated perspective of, you know, what they, what they call in the English department, um, dead, dead white writers, you know, you'd be missing an important part of the essence of what makes up our field. Uh, the idea of what, uh, Af what, what is it, the term which you use from? America. I, th I think it's Ladin. Uh, Ladin. Ladin. Okay. Ladin, uh -huh. um, Ladin America. Ladin America. America. Yeah. Even if we just look at the first, um, the first two, the first part of the word, uh, Ladino, right? That's where we can be, we can very well get a lot of our inspiration and our raw material in that intersection among all the cultures, right? among the Iberian cultures, among the African cultures, among the indigenous cultures, and that whole process of engagement, right? And to appreciate the power dynamic and so on and so forth, but to not minimize or, or marginalize the, cont the contribution of these other, other groups. And in, in the final analysis, that's what, I'm, that's what I feel that many people are, many established people are afraid of, you know? Thank you. Um, um, her name is, we, I just got a question on the chat. Um, her name is uh, Lidia Gonzalez. Lilia or Lidia? Anton. I'm writing it down. I'm writing okay, down the perfect, chat. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. It's Lidia Gonzalez. Um, so, I actually, now that we were talking about this, I will ask uh, one of my questions and it is um, something that you've also written about um, that sometimes, you know, there is some sort of a celebration of uh, black writings, but then that also, that's also some, some, some way of tokenizing um, the process and then it immobilizes the resistance and the and the motivation to you know bring in more because then everybody can point to it and be like well we've done this one course yeah, back yeah. in I don't know the 90s um, so I wanted to ask uh, what you suggest 
um, of how we continue the decolonial discourse in order to make sure we don't immobilize this debate, you know, by discussing it in academia. Is it already wrong that we're discussing it in this in this academic realm? Um, and how do we take it back to the streets? Or how do we, yeah, what do you suggest? How do we interact more? Except, I mean, I always think we have to include everything in our teachings um, in, in the academia. Yeah, um, it's a relevant question. Um, I know it's not fashionable to refer to Marx, <laughs> but uh, the fact is that there's an old Gramscian principle that, that recognizes that uh, the hegemonic group is sufficiently aware to observe, to take note of nuclei of resistance and opposition and incorporate buy them over through one means or another. That's not just theory. We've received, we have seen it in many uh, purportedly revolutionary or insurgent movements. We see it in the black middle class that's totally sold out and so on and so forth. And that's nothing new in terms of politics. Uh, whereas we, as far as we're concerned, even Sylvia Winter, who I, whom I have the greatest admiration, has this article not so long ago uh, where she was very critical of the Black Studies movement, right, and, and, um, and points a very sharp finger at the fact, at its limitations, and the fact that after 50 years, there's only few few departments that have, uh, that offer you a PhD in Black Studies or African American Studies. Think about that, you know, 30 million plus people biggest power on, on, on the earth, and where are the PhDs in this, right? Or the departments. And if, if that's hard to find in black studies departments, it's, it's harder to find, I would I suggest to me that in our areas, right, uh, Latin American studies, Ibero-American studies, and so on, it's, it's gonna be more difficult, right? Hence the, 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 the topic, the argument, my argument for today this conversation. So she's saying she was she's critical of those individuals because it's people who make history, right? Those actors, she said, they mistook the map for the territory. It's an interesting metaphor. They thought that by getting there, getting into these institutions and, and, um, and, and, and having departments, right? And having, having some recognition by the central administration that, that the job was over, no. The map is not the territory, see? And then the job, that's just the first step towards, towards transformation. So I hope that, 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 that that's useful uh, as, as a point of departure for thinking this through. Yeah, I guess um, it is, um, incredibly important as well, and I think uh, one of the good features of this reading group is something Richard Leventhal said that um, we can we can bring different traditions, academic traditions, together. Also, you know, because the U.S. The, at least they do have institutions in Europe. You don't even have the institution, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> we, yeah. yeah. We do, and and we're not uh, forced to specialize in one field. We're in the in the opposite. We're forced. We're like, we have to expand. So we have to do at least two different centuries, etc., different languages, yeah. um, which is. But then still, you can you can always avoid looking at the at the parts that that would matter. Yep. But yeah, Ron has a question. Sorry. I think I was muted. Uh, thanks, Katarina, and uh, thanks, Jerome, for your talk. I, I learned a lot um, listening to this. I found it very valuable. And one thing that occurred to me when I was thinking about the maybe the problem of narrowness of specialization, um, I've been I've been recently reading some historians who talk about revolts of enslaved people in the Spanish-speaking world and sort of its political implications for independence. I'm thinking of uh, Cristina Soriano and Marcela Echiverdi, who work in Colombia and uh, Venezuela specifically. 
And one of the things I, I noted when I'm, when I'm looking at this work is how uh, quickly I want to start to apply it to my own understanding of say the contemporary US uh, or to a question in the broader Caribbean. That is, it, it goes directly uh, into an interdisciplinary channel. And, and it makes me wonder if Hispanism itself is part of the problem conceptually. Um, I, I say that as somebody who was trained as a Hispanist and I'm grateful for that training, but, but sometimes I think that I've spent most of the rest of my career trying to untrain myself as a Hispanist, if that makes sense. And so I, I wonder if, if looking at the work of black writers um, in Latin America, if that is a challenge to Hispanism as a discipline. Uh, if that's a sort of an intractable conflict. Here's the thing. Um, it comes down to the notion of area studies and division of, and these uh, superficial borders, boundaries that we allow people to, to impose upon us, okay? Um, nothing is wrong with Hispanism per se, to the degree that we understand Hispanism from a broad view, from a broad standpoint, right? Hispanism as a modern, you know, as a modern concept. Um, and this is, you know, this is probably the core of my argument. It is, it is very reassuring to find now that people are interested in exploring the Spaniards. The Spanish are interested. Uh, Catarina just said, okay, in Europe, there are no departments, right? This is true. It is also true that you know even the even the British have not been teaching, uh, they are teaching uh, teaching their high school students about their own role in the slave trade, right? Uh, in Brazil, it is recent that the Brazilians have decided, you know, realized that oh, we don't have people train people to teach our students at every level, okay, about the contribution of. Africans and Afro descendants to Brazilian civilization, Brazilian culture. Right? So it's been for a couple of for the past couple of decades, this realization has been growing, and people have slowly been doing something about it. Right? But I'm saying that the old guard is, you know, stuck in its ways and is not really willing, as as happens, to see ground because you know you're a tenured professor and that's cool. You don't want to make the effort to go to to venture beyond, right? And the presence, and this is a more concrete thing, the presence, the African presence, that melanin, right, in the classroom, in on the faculty, is can be disturbing for many people who are accustomed to their own, you know, seeing their own and preserving, quote unquote, their own notion of um, of um, what what should obtain in, in the ivory tower, see? And it's important we understand, that we understand that the ivory tower, that ivory is not, by, is not an accident, right? That white ivory is not, not by accident, right? It is not, was not meant to have originally you know, um, others in there. I insist that this is a point I made. I make in the, the uh, Malungahi essay that for one of the lessons from those people is, as they said in the, um, the Saramaka, as they as they used to say in the, during the civil rights movement, is to keep your eye on the prize, to be aware of what it is, what it constitutes, what constitutes uh, liberation, what constitutes progress, and have. And, and be prepared to bite off chunks of quote unquote freedom, even if it's just a little bit at, at a time. Because overnight history does not change overnight. Things don't change, overnight. you know? But unless uh, the people who want change have an idea as to what their, obje what their objectives are, right? there's no, no, um, no progress. I don't know if that's wavering too much, but. That, that's that's my feeling. And to follow up, just to add, um, there are people who are quote unquote Afro-Hispanics, right? 
they've been produced, they've decided that they're gonna focus on one or another area of, of, of the experience, of the larger experience of Africans, Afro-descendants and their, and their relations, their integration with um, the rest of dominant society, right? Or non-dominant society in the case of Latin America. Uh, however, we have a, a very concrete politics of inclusion slash exclusion. In other words, the tradition in the work, in the labor market, right, is to keep to keep it keep it uh, keep the interests keep things white. And if we have a so-called minority, well, you know, one is enough. One is more than enough. Let's think about that for a minute. Traditionally, the old professors, right, could say, oh, I'm a 19th century specialist. I'm a 20th century specialist, right? I'm a colonial specialist. If you're doing Afro studies, you don't have that luxury. I mean, I'm telling you from my own experience, right? The field can easily cover from the 1400s that early contact between Spain, or rather Portugal, Spain, and the Africans. I'm, I'm talking before Columbus, 50, 60, 70 years before 14, 1492, all the way through to the current migration populations in Portugal and in Spain, right? As well as all the kernel, all the, the key moments in Latin American cultural, cultural history and cultural production. See, and one person cannot conceivably cover all of that. That's a separate field, I dare say, right? It has, there's enough cognitive possibilities, right? For that to be a separate field. Of course, we're dealing with departments that don't even recognize it as a, as a thing. So in many cases, so there's a lot of work to be done. Beatriz. Can I say something? Sí, por favor, Beatriz. Tenemos un minuto porque ya se acaba, ¿no? No puedo hacer hasta uh, No, we have another half an hour. You, oh, you have perfecto, time. Yeah, yeah, perfecto. Yeah, perfecto. Uh, I was just paralyzed here. I was like, wow. I guess I've been waiting to hear all those words for a long time. Uh, and I was just thinking of how complex uh, it has been for me as an Afro-Cuban who became an anthropologist uh, and who had this whole, and what I mean by Afro-Cuban, I mean a person that grew up around the religion that Afro-Cubans developed uh, as a result of their own resistance, right? In Cuba during the, the, uh, the colonization. But, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I uh, been recently struggling with combining what I learned from my elders and my mother. I, I, I am not a Yoruba priestess, but my, the women in my family are. And I always say that, this is funny, I don't mean to insult anybody, that I chose to marry the white men, meaning that I became an anthropologist. Um, and they resisted that. They actually, uh, my, my teacher had to go and ask them permission that uh, when I would become an anthropologist, I wouldn't give up my worldview. And this was literally, he actually went to my mother's temple. Uh, as, uh, and, but I lived in conflict, uh, not being, I was sort of like after going through the training, I became paralyzed. Uh, couldn't write, couldn't think, and just wanted to become invisible and I went to the South, uh, left New York. Then I went to Mexico. And that's where I found that when I was teaching there, I was teaching in Guerrero uh, in a rural anthropology program, but students asked me, well, if you come from the United States, how come you don't tell us about the Black Liberation Movement? This is my indigenous students. Uh, and I was 
with the dilemma that I was teaching a course called Latin American Seminar. And we we're supposed to read about all the Latin American experts and dependency development and all that. And my students are looking at me like, what? Are you gonna give us the same story and you are coming from the United States and we're here suffering? <laughs> you know, we're in the middle of a, a resistance here. Uh, and so I had to mediate because of course, you know, the anthropology department didn't want to even conceive that blackness was a possible topic. Um, and, and so now I'm looking back at that, at that experience and I'm thinking about the love that my indigenous students had for a black liberation theme was based, it was bigger than race. And by that, I mean, it wasn't because similar experience of oppression, but knowledge that they needed to survive as humans that were being oppressed. And so they told me like, hey, you know, there's hope because I sometimes lose, uh, or, you know, I, I have to go to Cuba and then my brothers intellectuals in Cuba, they sit down and they tell me, this poor child, right? Because of the way I think and the way that they think. Um, and, and so then, but I don't live there and I hardly communicate with them. Uh, but uh, hearing you speak, let me just say, because I don't encounter that only when I go to Cuba or when I'm there, I have lived uh, um, in, uh, in a, and in, in now my solution to this is combining my mother's traditions, my grandmother's tradition with academia for me to survive. I can't deny either one. I can't deny that I spent all my life being an anthropologist and that means colonial theories with the resistance of my mother uh, wanting to deal with migration and black people in New York and the war of Vietnam, okay? And, uh, and I'll go, you know, so, uh, I, I don't know if I could uh, say that I didn't want to speak because I am not clear in any of the things that I'm saying yet. Uh, or I have moments when I'm clear. And then I have moments like now after hearing you speak, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I don't know. Okay. What I mean by I don't know is that there's something special about, about being Africa and being. Uh, uh, grew up in the Caribbean in this experience uh, of, of flirting with being invisible sometimes and even feeling good about it. Where in the post-colonial, they tell me, no, that's bad, you gotta be visible, you know? But my family have told me, no, there's so much power in being invisible. Uh, and, and the more that I go in the field, meaning in the real life, not in our circles now, right? That I realize that Latin American Afro identity is a lot like wearing a mask, like the mask that we have in festivals, okay? And we just need to know when we wanna be visible and when we don't wanna be invisible. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm hoping one day that I'll be able to write this in a book because it, it became more clear after I went to do field work in Mexico, uh, in, 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 in some of the black towns, uh, it, it revealed something to me and it made my being a black Cuban uh, useful. But um, thank you so much. It was really all, you know, all of you that are here uh, because you know, the problem is not only academic with me, my problem is spiritual for the damage of uh, being damaged by institutional racism for too long. Okay. And so I have the wounds of those. Only they've been healed since I went to the South and I attended black institutions. So uh, uh, I can't say that I'm hopeful. Uh, not in my time, lifetime, uh, because uh, it's even difficult to explain blackness to your colleagues, your white colleagues, when you're talking about it and they, they want to explain to you what, how you feel.
Thanks for those reflections. Yes, very relevant. Uh, I find that, well, as writers, we all know that things become clearer when we try to articulate them, right? When we write them down, and then we review and, and, and change our minds a little bit, and so on. Um, so there's that, there's that purpose, there's that value to, to writing as well. Um, if I could riff a little bit off of what you said from, from the standpoint of Cuba, race, and the question of acceptability or acceptance and inclusion. In the Andes, they have a, 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 a phrase which applies to us as Afro-descendant people as well. They talk about el indio, el indio acept. something to the effect of the accepted or acceptable Indian, you know, which, which has to do with the, the acceptance or the internalization or the performance of certain protocols of behavior that would make you acceptable as, an, as a, a minority, as a racial minority or as a minoritized uh, uh, individual, citizen, right? Make you acceptable to, to the to the dominant groups. And here I think of speaking of masks and negotiation. Negotiation is a is a is has to be is a constant in any situation of, of power, right? Where the so-called uh, subaltern has to find ways of of dealing, right? And um, that's a very important topic in the whole experience, right? how to deal with the situation, how to deal with, how to interact with power. For example, in terms of culture, right? Uh, Nicolas Guillén is, is, is re regarded as Cuba's quote unquote national poet, right? He's of mixed heritage and it was convenient for the revolution to have to showcase him and his work as a sort of a prophet because he'd been preaching transformation, revolutionary change, and the colonial uh, positioning and politics since the and anti-racist uh, positioning and politics since the 1930s, decades before the revolution actually happened. Okay, and and here's an interesting uh, consideration. One of his first books when he started back writing in the 1930s was Motivos de Son, where he used um, the Afro-Cuban. Alanero urban vernacular, right? Uh, and, and it was a big splash, hearing black voices representing quote unquote black culture, uh, urban culture. It was, a, it was a, it made a splash. However, um, it was not acceptable for him to continue. He had two small, two short, uh, two small collections, Motivos de Son and um, Songo Roco Songo. Right, 1930, 31, 32, right? and then he switched later on and he, he expanded his scope and his next book was West Indies Limited, which was very anti-colonial in, in its outlook. But my point is that here's where the work of critics come in later on, right, to set things in order, to tell us how to think about these people, the writers. We have a big, a very important person, an icon of a revolution, may he rest in peace, uh, Roberto Fernandez Retamat, saying not so long after, okay, it was good for Nicolas Guillén to put black voices, make them audible in his poetry, right? But that's okay for now. It, is, it, is, it was more important for him to switch and to be his real self, to, to speak in Castilian, to write, you know, to use all of those, uh, all, all of the traditional meet, rhymes and meters and so on and so forth. And my question is, why can't he be both? We are all cultural mestizos. And if we let ourselves, if we let, if we allow ourselves, we can open those doors that have been closed to us and enrich ourselves as human beings, as academics, see? That, that, so that would be my argument. Guillen, West Indies Limited, Guillen had, has a, uh, an unforgettable poem to the Mau Mau in Kenya, in the, you know, in that anti-colonial uprising, 
beautiful work, but that's not, those aren't the, the kinds of poems that are, we are reminded of by the, by the dominant critics. Okay? And we have even people like, even someone as important as Nancy Morejon, who also won uh, the prize for, the national prize for Premio de Literatura Nacional okay, in Cuba, saying, sort of defending the, the, the pro, the Eurocentric view. Okay, Guillén is one of our, the purest uh, Spanish writers. This may be true, right? Give him credit for being a maestro when it comes to traditional uh, rhyme and meter. Right? Nothing wrong with that. But do not do that at the expense of his interest in the vernacular, in vernacular culture. Right? And I'm saying that this kind of, this, this is the kind of pressure that uh, throws people off track, right? This is the kind of pressure that comes down to, that you have to confront when you're dealing with, well, you don't need to, you don't have the time to go into the protocols of publication and so on on the early, the early revolution. But when you have the state dictating, you know, what your aesthetic should be, that's the kind of pressure that you have to confront. These are the things that you have to negotiate. And negotiation, that's my point. Negotiation is what confronts us in any situation wherever we are. Thank you very much. The other, the other thing I was just thinking of um, while Beatrice was talking and mentioning the invisibility is what you wrote about um, the knowledge of survival of the um, of how to walk underwater and how to be invisible um, from the Renacientes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, but I think um, other people might also have questions. I know that um, Felipe is writing a book about um, Afro-Latin American authors. Um, and I think Claudia and Jerome, you know each other from both working at Ely. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe there's already discussion ongoing, I'm not sure. And if not, um, I, the other thing, Claudia, you wanna ask something? Yes, please. Yes, I, I would like to, but I would like to switch languages if I can. Preferiría hablar en castellano si puede ser. Antes que nada, agradecerle muchísimo a Jerón, por supuesto, esa espléndida charla y los textos que acompañaron la charla. Eh, y bueno, en realidad tengo muchas preguntas, pero me voy a concentrar en una que mm, volvió a nacer también justamente a raíz de tus respuestas ahora también, Jerón. Porque no sé, eh, dedicándome últimamente un poco a literatura eh, mapuche, es decir, literatura indígena, de Chile, producida en Chile y en Argentina, eh, siempre me veo confrontado con preguntas que van, digamos, al mismo rumbo en el cual ahora voy a preguntar. Porque, por ejemplo, si vos, Jerome, estás hablando de, eh, de las posibilidades de la interseccionalidad o de las posibilidades y necesidades de la negociación, o también de las posibilidades de, de aceptar eh, culturas diferentes, tanto la cultura africana como latinoamericana, hispana, integrarlo todo, digamos, en un escritor, una escritora eh, afrodescendiente, eh, latinoamericana, afrodescendiente, por ejemplo, es una cosa si vos lo decís, pero si, por ejemplo, una persona blanca lo dice o, digamos, defiende o mantiene ciertos puntos de vista, puede muy fácilmente sonar o provenir también de una posición que puede ser reconciliadora o que puede ser exotizante, que realmente también conlleva eh, problemas desde el punto eh, el punto racial también eh, del cual se está hablando sobre literatura indígena o sobre literatura eh, afro-latinoamericana. 
etc. Entonces, ¿cómo ves, por ejemplo, esto? Eh, la importancia o no importancia eh, del o de la persona que habla, se dedica a eh, las llamadas literaturas de minorías, de las llamadas minorías que no lo son, eh, o las llamadas literaturas subalternas, etc. Sería una de mis preguntas y la dejo acá. Gracias, Claudia. Un gran saludo para ti. Que... Tenemos tiempo de no vernos. Gracias por la pregunta. Um, mira, lo que dices tiene, tiene mucho de cierto. La crítica dominante ha sido responsable. Su, su vocación, su responsabilidad es mantener el status quo. ¿no? Conservar el poder en sus centros tradicionales y dar permiso, crear aperturas, pero de, de manera muy limitada, ¿sí? en aras de mantener el status quo. Y de ahí la minimización, la desvirtuación, la estereotipificación de, de las llamadas minorías, ¿cierto? Tenemos toda, toda una tradición de, de ello. Eh, contra la cual tenemos que, que, que luchar. Correcto. Ahora bien, eso no quiere decir que... Eh, eso no quiere decir que solamente las personas de ascendencia afro, las personas de, 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 de ascendencia indígena, tienen la capacidad crítica. Eso sería un, un absurdo. ¿no? Eso sería... Uh, no aceptar los retos de la justicia. ¿no? Uh, y para mí que todos estamos llamados a, a adoptar, a, 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 a responder, responder estas crisis uh, históricas por las que estamos atra atravesando. ¿no? Um, Eso es en, 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 en palabras breves. Por otra parte, yo sí diría a, a título personal que combatir, bueno, para hablar en términos uh, francos, combatir el racismo no es únicamente el problema o el reto o, el, o el lo que sea de los afro o de los subalternos. La resolución tendría que ser como en cualquier proceso transformativo, ¿sí? a través de alianzas. Ahora bien, cómo estructurar, cómo definir esas alianzas, eso tendría que responder a circunstancias particulares o generales según el caso, ¿cierto? A circunstancias, a una cierta objetividad y subjetividad al, a la cuestión, ¿no? Pero para mí que... Um, no, eh, es cosa de todos y todas. ¿ya? Y, y, y el, el, um, el compromiso nace desde dentro. Y el, la, la epidermis no, no es garantía de nada, de ningún, de ningún bando. ¿no? Eso no es garantía, garantía de nada. La solidaridad se entiende, se, se manifiesta, se practica de, de forma transracial. Es por eso que inclu, inclusive lo mencioné en mi, en mi artículo sobre la cuestión del malungaje, ¿no? que esta cosa histórica que se llama el racismo tendría que resolverse a través de ¿no? eh, procesos de solidaridad transracial. ¿no? Espero que eso haya de alguna forma uh, expresado mi, mi opinión. Felipe. Eh, hola, Jerón. Muchas gracias por tu, por tu charla. Eh, realmente me ha inspirado mucho eh, pues, desde que leí tu ensayo Malungaje y ahora con, con, con tu intervención. Eh, me quedo con una idea muy, que para mí ha sido muy eh, poderosa hoy, 
eh, y también porque lo he experimentado durante mi proyecto de investigación y es que eh, dedicarse a, a los estudios eh, afrohispánicos, en mi caso, eh, y, y, al, y a toda la experiencia histórica de, de, de lo afro, eh, rompe las, las, los límites del conocimiento porque eh, realmente recoger eh, a través de, de algunos conceptos todo un proceso histórico que es realmente muy complejo eh, y una cosa que, eh, digamos, de la que estoy convencido y que, que trato de llevar adelante con mi proyecto es que es posible eh, hacer un trabajo de reconfiguración histórica alrededor de lo que ha sido la experiencia eh, de la presencia africana en América Latina. Eh, tanto, digamos, no solo desde eh, el, la, es, la esclavitud, la esclavización de los africanos, sino todo el, el, el proceso eh, que luego tuvieron eh, los afrodescendientes en, en territorio americano, sus alianzas, eh, sus procesos de resistencia y, eh, digamos, a través del corpus de novelas que yo escogí eh, entre el siglo XIX y el siglo XX, de las, algunas de las que hablaste en el siglo XIX, eh, Petrona y Rosalía, por ejemplo, de Félix Tanco Osmeniel, eh, y en el siglo XX, eh, digamos, algunos autores, eh, Alejo Carpentier, eh, Lidia Cabrera, me he dado cuenta que es posible... O sea, tradicionalmente estos autores y estas novelas han sido circunscritas dentro de unos límites muy precisos de las literaturas nacionales o de las literaturas regionales, etc. Y justamente desde la perspectiva de lo afro esto se rompe y creo que es posible eh, traer eh, la, la, digamos, eh, su... su su interpretación de, de la historia, su crítica de, eh, de, de, la, de, de la hegemonía eh, desde la perspectiva afro. O sea, es posible leer esta literatura desde otra perspectiva y reconfigurar esos límites del conocimiento, expandirlo mucho más. Y, digamos, esa es como la oportunidad que, que he encontrado con este proyecto. Eh, y me parece, digamos, que es, es muy, muy importante tener esa idea clara, que estudiar eh, estos fenómenos y estos procesos, por supuesto que no únicamente desde lo afro, sino también desde lo indígena y desde todas estas experiencias subalternizadas, racializadas, nos permite ver cuál ha sido el proceso de segregación, de discriminación, digamos, cómo se ha constituido también eh, el poder hegemónico a través de eso, digamos, del, del afianzamiento del status quo. O sea, sí estoy convencido que leer desde esta perspectiva la literatura definitivamente nos permite ver con más claridad esos, esos fenómenos, hacer crítica de esos procesos. Y por eso agradezco mucho esta, esta oportunidad. Sin lugar a dudas. Y que conste que estoy a sus órdenes para cualquier eh, consulta futura. Gracias. You're all welcome to switch back and forth. Eh, podemos seguir en, en español como ustedes quieran. Una cosa que yo quería mencionar que me pareció muy importante para ese discurso es um, algo que ya dijiste un poco antes, Jerome, eh, sobre la confrontación y el miedo de, los, de, de, la, fa, de la facultad, de la gente del Ivory Tower, que, es, que en la mayoría es, siguen ser todos blancos. Yo diría que, que hay, hay que decirles que sientan miedo, ¿no? Como dice, marcando territorio. <laughs> like, negotiation is... Um, the polite way of doing this, pero um, al final del tiempo es que hay que confrontarse y pues, pues para, que, para que se crea una conciencia, um, para, que, para que sientan las, las otras experiencias. Y 
Y bueno, yo una, una bueno, yo estudio literatura y, y doy clase de literatura, entonces pensé que la literatura normalmente me da esa opción de sentir um, y vivir experiencias que yo no vivo en mi vida. Y yo creo que, el, que hay un potencial muy grande en la literatura, pero obviamente también en la poesía, en las canciones, en todo, en todo, en todo el material que tenemos para, para estudiar, para dar las clases. Tienes toda la razón. Eh, esa experiencia de la imaginación que nos brinda la literatura es clave en todo esto, ¿verdad? Porque aprendemos a leer, aprendemos a apreciar al otro, a la, a la otra edad a través de la imaginación, ¿cierto? Y en ese momento muchas veces se nos infiltran ideas nocivas, ¿no? Pero lo importante es que tenemos esa capacidad innata de imaginarnos en otros mundos, con otras personas, con, otra, con otros personajes, ¿no? Eh, y ese es el punto de partida. Evidentemente, cuando vemos resistencia, es hora de preguntarnos por qué. ¿Por qué la resistencia? Ese es el trabajo nuestro. ¿no? Averiguar por qué la resistencia. ¿A qué se debe? ¿Y a dónde va? ¿No? ¿A qué sirve? ¿A qué sirven, eso? ¿A qué sirven esos procesos de exclusión y evasión? ¿No? ¿Para qué fue construido este edificio de conocimiento con reconocibles eh, vacíos? ¿No? Una vez teniendo eso más o menos claro, nos damos cuenta que no hay que pedirle perdón a nadie para leer e interpretar. ¿Verdad? Sí. Yeah, una vez uno se, se da cuenta, you can't unsee it. You can't, you cannot. You always, you always see the, the void. Pero Hans, por favor, um, pregunta. This is the last question and then we'll wrap it up. Es un, es un comentario. Bueno, muchas gracias, Jerome, por su espléndida conferencia. Eh, me gustó mucho. La estaba escuchando con el micrófono prendido, con la cámara apagada. Tenía un caos acá en mi, en mi ordenador. Eh, bueno, quería hacerle una, una, un comentario, en realidad. Eh, usted... Eh, tocó en, en, en su última intervención un aspecto que es importante, que es el de la solidaridad, digamos, el, la solidaridad, solidaridad transracial, eh, usted mencionó. Y bueno, me recordaba también como trabajaba con, con mencionó autores del canon literario cubano, y bueno, estaba viendo en su concepto del malungaje también, que usted hace referencia a los palenques de los cimarrones, ¿no?, estaba pensando en, en, el, en el libro el, La biografía del cimarrón de Miguel Barnett y Esteban Montejo. Y bueno, Miguel Barnett es un autor muy controversial y en una de las ocasiones dijo, yo políticamente soy un negro también. Y, y bueno, ahí vi más o menos esta solidaridad que, a la cual usted hacía referencia, que fue una frase provocativa, porque bueno, Miguel Barnett es de origen gallego, como sabemos. Eh, y bueno, y él establece esta alianza con este Esteban Montejo y bueno, llevan a cabo la, dice Barnett, eh, Esteban Montejo fue víctima del racismo, víctima de la discriminación, lo pasó muy mal, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, construyó toda una historia, conectó teleológicamente el texto con la Revolución Cubana, es decir, los barbudos de la sierra habrían sido los descendientes prácticamente de los cimarrones. Y bueno, hace poco ha sido un comentario también de una lectura de Michael Soisky, en la cual él encontraba que realmente el Esteban Montejo de carne y hueso estaba conectado más bien con dictadores eh, de la isla. Es decir, aparecían simultáneamente eh, dos cimarrones, digamos. Y bueno, me recordaba que en los años 90, precisamente en Estados Unidos, la crítica que hizo eh, los testimonial studies, el Sieta Sklodowska, John Beverly, ellos acuñaron precisamente el concepto de la estética de la solidaridad que fue un concepto muy criticado en, en la crítica testimonial de los años 90, porque decían más bien esto obedece a patrones ideológicos y no a patrones que tengan que ver con la estética propiamente tal de los textos. Y bueno, esa era como la ambivalencia, podríamos decir, del, del género 
eh, testimonial y de la canonización que se hizo del género testimonial desde Estados Unidos, en base principalmente a la obra maestra de, 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 de Esteban Montejo y Miguel Barnett y el texto de la, de la Rigoberta Menchú. Entonces, bueno, hacía esa conexión con lo que usted mencionaba de la, de la solidaridad que debe existir entre personas de diferente eh, epidermis, de diferente tinte de piel, eh, y hacía la conexión con el texto de, de Esteban Montejo y de Miguel Barnett. Mira... Um... Sucede, lo, sucede lo, lo siguiente. Somos críticos, ¿verdad? Es nuestro tra trabajo. Um, para mí que a Miguel Barnett se le debe dar su, 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 su reconocimiento mismo, por el mismo hecho de habernos presentado ese texto. ¿ya? A la vez... Como críticos tenemos que tener conciencia de su lugar en, ese, en, ese, en esa estructura ideológica, gubernamental, ¿entiendes? Que fue la Revolución Cubana en, en, en la década del 70. Quiero decir que un Miguel Barnett, al pensarlo, al hablar de él, hay que estar consciente del privilegio que tenía. ¿sí? Que el cubano ordinario de, de ascendencia africana no ten, tenía o tendría. Él, inclusive, había vivido en Estados Unidos. Hay que entenderlo también. Hay que saber percibir cierta condescendencia hacia el sujeto, ¿no? el, el entrevistado. ¿no? Cierto paternalismo. Todo, hay que entender toda la relación de poder entre los dos, ¿no? Nosotros, como críticos, tenemos que, es, es parte de nuestra labor, en, en otras palabras, leer entre líneas y saber ubicarlos a, a los dos, ¿no? E inclusive criticar al mismo Montejo como sujeto esclavizado, uh, escapado, etcétera, y sus relaciones Um, relación de género, de relación con los otros um, uh, cubanos de, de ascendencia africana, los otros esclavos, etc. Es un trabajo uh, potencial muy, muy interesante para mi gusto, ¿no? Pero no me cabe duda de cierto posicionamiento de, de, de Miguel Barnett. Si tú lo visitabas en su, en su momento de gloria, ahí en La Habana, ¿no? como jefe de, tenía todo un, un edificio, todo, um, hasta servidores, puedo decir, ¿no? Ten, ocupaba un, un espacio de privilegio um, dentro de la, de la uh, ¿cómo se llama? En, en Cuba. Entonces, es parte, es cosa que tenemos que saber incorporar en nuestra interpretación del momento del evento. Claro, bueno, o sea, sí, en, en efecto Pero también hay un aspecto que usted igual mencionó Que es el de las negociaciones eh, Y bueno, ¿por qué tenemos que pensar siempre Que el subalterno va a ser el dominado? El subalterno también tiene estrategias de resistencia Mediante las cuales puede manipular al no subalterno Y que en el caso del Esteban Montejo Yo creo que él sí las tenía Exacto. Es decir, bueno, claro, usted tiene razón cuando habla de nuestra labor como investigadores, eh, está justamente en ver esos mecanismos que están funcionando de la relación de poder entre los interlocutores, se puede decir. Y lo Gracias. Ha, Roberto Menchú lo ha dicho bien claro, ¿no? Algunas cosas sí voy a decir, algunas cosas no. ¿Qué? No tres, ¿no? Yo sí, silencios. Que compartir lo que yo quiera compartir. ¿sí? Lo mismo pasa con Montejo. ¿no? Uh, eso es lo que tienen los llamados débiles. Es decir, que no es por, no por subalterno, um, quiere decir que no tienen poder o agencia a ese, a ese nivel de negociar o manipular. Mm. Los esclavizados, las esclavizadas eran maestros y maestros de eso, a pesar del poder que tenían los... los, los los disque amos, amos, ¿no? 
Entonces, gracias. Es parte del trabajo nuestro. Muchas gracias. Pues miles de gracias. Eh, lamentablemente tenemos que, que terminar la discusión acá, pero yo creo que ha sido perfecto y muy valuable para todo lo que, que hemos estado haciendo durante los pasados meses. Eh, y antes de decirles adiós, yo quisiera agradecerles también a mi equipo en el Instituto de Estudios Latinoamericanos acá en la, en la Columbia University, que son Esteban Andrade, Jali García, Andrea López y Pilar Arriaga. Y sin ellos eh, y ellas eh, no hubiera sido posible hacer esto y sin Claudio Lomnitz tampoco que eh, él me ha dado el espacio de hacerlo acá. Um, hay mucha más gente que, ama, que, que ha estado en, um, en, ese, en ese proceso y sobre todo es gracias a ustedes, a los y las presentadoras um, y, y los participantes de ese grupo que siempre han sido discusiones increíbles, muy importantes, yo creo, muy importantes para lo que estamos haciendo. Y, um, y bueno... Sí, um, miles de gracias a todos ustedes. Sin ustedes nada de eso hubiera sido posible. Y espero que volvamos a vernos. Yo estoy pensando de cómo seguir ese, ese grupito de lectura, si seguimos con una publicación, como ya lo mencioné, o si seguimos en otro formato, eh, algo que también estoy hablando para, el, para recomenzar en el fall. De todas maneras, yo les, yo les mando, yo les seguiré mandando correos eh, con, les, con los enlaces del YouTube y espero que estemos en contacto. Y aquí estamos. Yo voy a compartir la lista con eh, todas las, las sesiones que hicimos, con todos los enlaces YouTube de los recordings. Y también, eh, si ustedes están de acuerdo, voy a compartir los contactos de todos los correos para que puedan eh, colaborar. En, en como sea pero bueno muchísimas gracias um, ha sido un placer increíble tenerlos acá muchas gracias gracias muchas gracias a ustedes también y mucho éxito gracias, gracias. chao estamos en contacto a de colonizar eso, eso mismo buen, buen, buen verano ¿eh? buen verano gracias hasta luego chao.